Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I'm here to continue reading the book that we've been reading, Witch Witch by Eva Abotson, published by Scholastic, who've allowed us to read it to you. We're gonna pick up where we left up with chapter 15. The last thing that has happened is that Madame Olympia has finally done her trick, and it was a doozy. Um, Unfortunately, she's also stolen Rover, Terence's pet worm, and the familiar that makes it so that Belladonna can do black magic. With Belladonna's trick upcoming, Terence, Mr. Ledbetter, and the ogre Lester have decided that they need to hire an actor to pretend to be Sir Simon to make it seem as though Belladonna has done the trick, even though Rover is gone. And that's where we're going to pick up. Chapter 15. Armin woke up the Sunday before Halloween with a headache. Like Terence, he'd had a dream, and the dream had teeth in it. He'd seen this necklace floating in the air with five brand new molars on it, cusps, fillings, and all. Armin had known at once that they were his teeth, and he'd start making teeth calling noises, like the noise that you call cows in to be milked or chickens to be fed, but the teeth wouldn't come to him, and they sort of sneered and floated away. And then Araman woke up and had been almost glad to hear from under the lid of the soup tureen the muffled cries of, Daddy! Daddy! with which the Kraken greeted Dawn. Mr. Chatterjee was already breakfasting inside of his bottle looking cheerful and relaxed. The climate of the north of England didn't really suit him, and as soon as witch number seven had done her trick, he was going to fly home to Calcutta. Well, we've got the day free, said Araman, who was always jolly at breakfast. Witch number seven's not going to do her trick till tomorrow night. Myself, I think I'll do a little smiting and blighting today. I'm getting short of exercise. What about you, Sniveller? But the ghoul, sitting hunched and exhausted over his kidneys, didn't answer. He almost never did. So Aramit went off and blighted some fir trees and cleft some boulders and twain and called a thunderstorm from the west, clean old-fashioned magic, which he enjoyed, and thought how nice it had been when the wizard watcher had sat peacefully at the gate and his oak trees had not been filled with sleeping grocers and lost witches had not bubbled about in bottomless holes on his east lawn. Well, tomorrow it'll be over, he thought. Tomorrow I'll know for certain who my wife is going to be. No, I'm being silly, I know now. After which he went to find Mr. Ledbetter to ask him for some milk of magnesia tablets. Magician or no, Araman had a stomach ache. Meanwhile, down at the campsite, Belladonna sat wretchedly by the campfire, facing the fact that Araman the Awful was lost to her forever. Even before the Enchantress did her trick, Belladonna had not really hoped to win, though when Terence was with her, she sometimes felt confident and strong. Now, all hope was gone. She reached for the magic mirror. Armin was gulping down small white pills. He looked tired and anxious, but what was that to do with her? It would be Madame Olympia now who would comfort him and smooth the cursed curl from his furrowed brow. Her sad thoughts were interrupted by a fierce rocking noise behind her, followed by a scramble and a swoosh and Mother Bloodwort crawled out of Belladonna's tent, her flies sticking like a doormat around her head. The old witch had been a coffee table for far too long, and as she collapsed into the camp stool that Belladonna pulled out for her, she looked very battered and confused. What's happened? she said, blinking. Was the last one a swan? I'm afraid not, Belladonna said gently. It was a budgie, a very intelligent one, but asked for a biscuit. Not the same, though, is it? The old witch remarked. Don't know where I went wrong. Think of very high marks, I suppose. Well, three out of ten. Not bad, really. More than I'll get, anyway. Mother Bloodwort kicked off her slippers so that the fire could get at her bunions and stared sadly into the flames. Wouldn't have made a difference if you'd managed the. Uh, wouldn't have made a difference if you'd managed the swan bit said Belladonna, trying to comfort the old woman, because Madame Olympia would have won anyway. She did this absolutely terrifying thing with rats. The Symphony of Death, it was called. She got nine out of ten. No one can possibly beat her. Symphony of Death, eh? said Mother Bloodwort thoughtfully. I've heard of that. Very black, that is. Very nasty. There's not too many witches that could even do that in my day. I should think she'd gobble up poor Araman as soon as look at him. 
Good job, he's got nice teeth. Oh no, no, don't say that, cried Belladonna. Armin's the mightiest wizard in the world. She couldn't hurt him, she couldn't. Oh, well, maybe not, said Mother Bloodwort. She sighed. I suppose marriage wouldn't have really suited me. I've lost the habit, I reckon, and turning myself young against Belle doesn't seem to be up to much. She got up creakingly and went to fetch her tin with the coronation on the lid and began to shake her head into it, blowing on the flies as they fell to change them back into maggots. Best be getting for it, ready for lunch, I suppose. But before Mother Bloodwort could move, Ethel Feedbag and Mabel Rack came lurching up to them, both heaving with rage. Look, said Mabel, putting down the bucket in which she was taking Doris for her midday stroll and pointing with a shaking arm at the enchantress's caravan. Stuck up, snooty old cow, raged Ethel Feedbag. Belladonna looked up, frowning. How strange, she said. Madame Olympia's caravan was the kind with a little stove and a chimney, and of course, as she was a witch, the smoke from her chimney was blowing against the wind. But that wasn't what had made Ethel and Mabel so mad. Madame Olympia had magicked the smoke so that it came out in letters. The letter O, followed by the letter C again. Over and over, standing out as clear as could be against the deep blue sky of autumn. What does it mean? asked Belladonna. What do you think it means? snarled Mabel Rack. Those are her new initials, of course. Olympia Canker. She's letting us all know she's won. But she hasn't won. She hasn't. The voice was a new one, and Belladonna, hearing it, sprang to her feet. Terence! Oh, I'm so glad you're back. You've no idea how much I missed you. But though he hugged her as lovingly as always, Terence's mud-colored eyes were fixed on the enchantress's chimney and his jaw was set. You're going to beat her, Belladonna. You're going to get a 10 out of 10 tomorrow. You'll see. Chapter 16. In the great hall at Darkington, the clock struck 11. An hour until the true beginning of Halloween, the feast of the dead in which the shades of the departed grow closer for a few dread hours to those they have left behind. In a dozen sconces, the tall candles burnt with a sickly flame. Logs of gnarled and knotted alderwood, like ancient severed limbs, hissed and spat in the grate, and the wind howling through the rafters eerily stirred the tapestry of the gentleman being shot with the arrows while burning at the stake. Belladonna, waiting for her turn, was as white as a sheet under her gown and mask. Terence had taken her through the trick again and again. He told her that everything would be ready, laid out on a great refractory table covered with a cloth, and that he himself would be hiding under it, ready to hand her over at the right moment and prompt her if she forgot anything. And waiting behind a tall embroidered screen with the other witches, she could see that he'd been as good as his word. The table, with its candlesticks and its grinning skull and a portrait of Sir Simon, looked just like one of those dreadful necromancy altars she'd seen in books. But that only made her more horribly afraid of the deed that she was about to do. Witch number seven, step forward, commanded Mr. Ledbetter. The secretary was looking tired and careworn. However much he argued with himself, it seemed to him that cheating was not the same as wizardry and darkness. Cheating, whichever way you looked at it, was mean. And what if Monty Moon let them down and they, all they'd done was make Belladonna look a fool? But Belladonna, trying to stop her knees from trembling, was walking towards the judge's table. And pulling himself together, Mr. Ledbetter said, Announce your trick. Belladonna turned and bowed low to the judges. Her voice shook a little on the first words, but she lifted her head bravely and her clear young voice reached even to the furthest corner of the hall. I'm going to bring Sir Simon Montpelier back from the dead said Belladonna, allowing herself a lingering look at Aramin as he sat, brooding and a little bored between the other judges. But at her word, the magician leaned forward, furiously frowning, and a spurt of fire burst from his left ear. Going to do necromancy, was she? A deed so difficult that he, Aramin the Awful, had failed at it again and again? A little slip of a witch, not up to his shoulder. How dare she? For a moment, it looked as though Araman was going to make a scene, but even as he brought his fist down, ready to bang it on the table, his curiosity got the better of him. It was impertinence, of course, and most appalling cheek. Still, it wouldn't hurt to let her try. Perhaps she had guessed how achingly he longed for his plashing, ghostly friend. 
So Belladonna stepped forward to the table with its long cloth and candlesticks and skull, and she did as she did so, Terence slipped Rover's closed box into the pocket of her gown. Then she took a pin from her other pocket and jabbing it into her fingers, let a drop of blood fall like a red pearl into the incense pot. And immediately there was a flash and a sheet of rose and amethyst and orange smoke rose almost to the roof. Thank God, said Lester, who believed that if you had to cheat, it was best to cheat good and proper. He'd heard a van drive into the courtyard at dawn, but that was the only sign of Monty Moon and his crew, and he'd begun to have doubts. Let there be darkness, said Belladonna, and instantly every candle guttered and went out, and the hall was plunged into inky, impenetrable night. Belladonna let the darkness and silence stay there for a moment, making everyone's flesh crawl a little. Then she took the hollow skull and walked to the magic triangle that Terence had chalked out for her below the tapestry. Do you hear me? Shades of the underworld, cried Belladonna, raising the skull. They heard her. First came a low, fearful murmuring, which swelled to a cacophony of cackling, screaming and screeching, and under the table, Terence sighed with relief. Mr. Moon had been as good as his word, and better. Belladonna's teeth were chattering badly now. It seemed that Terence was right, and that with Rover to help her, there was no limit to her darkness. But she went on bravely, and putting down the skull, she fetched the portrait of Sir Simon and held it aloft. I call upon thee, shades, to release from eternal torment the spirit of this man, she intoned. More screams and yells from the spirit, while the rafters, in the rafters, the ravens hideously croaked. Sir Simon Montpelier, Knight of Darkington, I command thee to appear, cried Belladonna. The jabbering and screeching died away. And now in the black silence of the hall, there appeared a series of white disembodied lights which bobbed and flickered, giving off at the same time a most unendurable stench of decay. Corpse candles, murmured Mother Bloodwort, drawing her skirt away from one which had come too close. Then all in the same second, the corpse candles went out. And all over the hall, there spread a coldness such there as they had never experienced, the coldness of the tomb, the grave of death itself. I wonder how he did that, murmured Lester, whose respect for Mr. Moon was growing every minute. Some sort of chemical, I suppose. But now the coldness was passing, and everybody's gaze was drawn upwards to the wall on the left of the chimney breast. For the tapestry of the man, struck with arrows while burning at the stake, was beginning to glow and shine and shimmer with the most unearthly light. Belladonna felt in her pocket for her last squeeze of Rover's box. She was incredibly tired, and her knees felt like water, but she couldn't weaken now. And taking up a wand from the table, she struck the ground thrice, and prompted by Terence, who had been whispering all the spells along with her, the words that are older than any book of, older than any book of magic in the world, world came out of her mouth. Allay for Tizian, for Tizio Roa, cried Belladonna. The glow around the tapestry grew stronger. The clock struck midnight, and as the last chime died away, there crept around the edge of the hanging, slowly and gropingly, a hand. A white hand, limp and long-fingered, with an emerald ring on one knuckle. For one moment, the hand just hung there. Then it felt for the sides of the tapestry, and with a sudden violent gesture, tore it from the wall and threw it on the ground. And there, stepping from the stone recess, wane and weary, but definitely alive, the figure of an Elizabethan knight. A shriek of joy from Araman broke the stunned silence. Sir Simon, is it really you? He cried, pushing his chair back so hard that it crashed the ground. And dashing forward, he seized the specter's hands in his own. I, tis I, intoned Sir Simon, Sir Simon. His voice was high and reedy, like an oboe playing something sad. Ye see before ye the guilty, tainted flesh of Sir Simon Mont Montmor Sir Simon Montmorency Montpelier. Oh, I can't believe it, but yes, yes, I can feel you. You're solid. Look at that vein throbbing in your left temple. Oh, happy, happy day. What ecstasy, what bliss. Sir Simon removed his left hand from Armin's grasp, 
and brought it up to his forehead. The plashing sound was much, much better than when he'd been a ghost. More solid, wetter, in every way more real. Araman was quite overcome. The talks we'll have, the confidences, the walks, the delights of nature we will share. My dear, dear fellow, this is the best day of my life. Then, remembering at last that this was a competition, Araman turned to the other gentleman. Ten out of ten, gentlemen, are we agreed? The ghoul nodded. He'd have liked the whole world to be inhabited by people who were dead, and kind Mr. Chatterjee smiled. But these words were never heard by Belladonna. Overcome by fatigue, terror, and strange, and strain, Belladonna had fainted. You can see a picture of a hand creeping around the corner. Chapter 17. Belladonna woke in a four-poster bed in a room at the very top of the North Tower at Darkington. Mr. Ledbetter and the ogre had carried her there after the end of the competition, while Terence hopped around her, worrying about her and congratulating her at the same time. Belladonna couldn't remember much about it now, only that she'd been anxious about the baby rabbits and about not having a toothbrush, and that Terence had said that he'd go down to the campsite and see to everything. How long ago had that been, she wondered. It seemed to be dark, but she felt refreshed and very happy. She'd done it. She won. She was to be the bride of Araman, to be with him always, to stroke his mustache and massage his ankles if they swelled and share his secrets, his hopes, and his fears. Oh, glory, said Belladonna, and the smiling fell asleep once more. But a happy white witch... A white witch, blissfully in love, can be a disaster. While Belladonna slept, the room began to fill with exquisite saucer-sized snowflakes, each a perfect six-pointed star, and the flakes did not melt, but alighted softly on the hangings of the bed, the embroidered rug, and the washstand. An enameled music box burst from the chest of drawers and began to play a dreamy Viennese waltz. Strings of gold and silver tinsel draped themselves across the ceiling and the window sills filled with rows of crystal goblets brimful of knickerbocker glory, knickerbocker glories, large ice cream sundaes. But Belladonna, knowing nothing of this, slept on. While Belladonna lay dreaming in the tower room, Araman sat in the library talking to Sir Simon Montpelier. Araman had suggested that the knight might like to slip into something more comfortable than the breastplate and leg armor that he'd worn for 400 years, and although he'd murmured something about his underclothes not being quite the thing, the wife slayer was now wearing Araman's second best dressing gown, a maroon one appliqued with fiends and pitchforks, and was telling the magician the story of his life. So the Lady Anne was the first of your wives, inquired Araman, pushing the whiskey decanter towards his friend. Even so, agreed Sir Simon, she was the one I drowned. Ere the cock crew thrice, I drowned her. I had to. She made it the sleeping chamber rumble, as if cleft in twain. Ah, she snored, you mean, said Araman. A very distressing that. Nothing worse. The knight nodded and blushed a little. Then I went to Lady Mary. Her I took by the throat and fastened my foul fingers around. Strangulation. Araman nodded. She hath cheated me of my victuals. So then I fiddled the housekeeping, did she? In that case, she deserved everything she got. Um, and the next one? Next I espoused the fair Olivia. Her I walled up in the privy for looking with favor upon the knave who emptied of her slops. Araman shook her head. Terrible, terrible. What you've been through. Sir Simon went on to tell the magician about the Lady Julia, whom he'd stabbed in the buttery because she had a horrid little dog that yapped, the Lady Letitia, whom he'd thrown over a cliff because she guzzled and he was just about to start on the Lady Henrietta, whom he'd knocked off with a poisoned halibut because she drove him nutty walking in her sleep, when there was a knock on the door and the ogre entered. The Kraken's in the tureen waiting for you to say goodnight, sir, and I've laid out your pajamas. Is there anything else you require? No, no, Lester, that's fine. You can go to bed. I've put Sir Simon in the green room, said Lester, winking at Mr. Moon, on account of it being handy for the bathroom like. Good, good, said the magician impatiently. There was still one more wife to go, and he wanted to hear about her. There is a postcard from the Wizard Watcher by the late post, sir, the ogre continued. It has reached 
Skinness in hopes to be back the day after tomorrow. He'd got through to the magician at last. Now that's good news. I'm really glad about that. I wouldn't have liked it to miss the wedding. But the word wedding had a bad effect on Araman. His brooding face darkened and he drained his whiskey in a single desperate gulp. Uh, you've no idea what women do, Lester. Sir Simon's been telling me they snore and they have little dog and they walk little dogs and they walk in their sleep. Those are just ordinary women. I mean, the switch. She must be very, very black to do necromancy. I should think a witch as black as that would have some pretty nasty habits. Not necessarily, sir. And if she's blacker than me, I mean, I don't want to be henpecked. I can't imagine any siller than a henpecked wizard. Sir, said Lester, losing his patience, you haven't even seen witch number seven. And yet, anyway, what about your duty to wizardry and darkness? What about this blighting black baby you're going to have? What, said Lester, did we have this blinking contest for? The magician sighed. Yes, yes, you're quite right, Lester. I'll go and see her first thing in the morning and fix the date. As Lester, Les as Lester left the room, Araman was leaning forward eagerly and saying, and the last one, the Lady Beatrice, wasn't it? What did she do? Smelled, said Sir Simon gloomily, most vilely and horribly hath she smelled. And having come to the end of his wives, the knight poured himself another whiskey and began again at the beginning. Araman kept his word, and the next morning saw him climbing the curved step to Belladonna's tower. The magician wasn't feeling too good. Sir Simon had told him about his murdered wife, not once, but three times. And though Araman understood how much the wife slayer needed to talk after 400 years of only plashing, he did feel very tired. Nor were the ogre and the secretary following closely behind him, exactly full of beans. They spent the night worrying in case the real Sir Simon burst clangingly through the panel and gave the game away. And they didn't really like the way that Monty Moon was settling into his part. That was the trouble with actors. You could get them on stage, but getting them off was another matter. Ledbetter, you wouldn't lie to me, said Araman, turning round. Is she covered in warts? I mean, covered? No, sir, not at all. Well, what about her fingers and toes? All there, are they? No stumps, for example? Nothing webbed? Nothing clawed? No, sir. The magician climbed a few more steps and then turned around again. Uh, er, and nothing personal, you understand, because yours is charming. I mean, it's a part of you, but it could be awkward in a wife. In short, Ledbetter, has she got a tail? You know, one of those forked jobs, a bit black and bushy. No, sir, said the secretary. Which number seven is tailless? And her name is Belladonna. That's right. Belladonna Canker. Ah, oh, well, and reaching the top step, Araman paused, took a deep breath, and threw open the door. Belladonna was sitting up in bed. The sun streaming in through the east window had turned her hair into a shower of gold. Her eyes were bright with happiness and blue as a summer sky, and she was singing a sweet and foolish little song, the kind with roses in it, and springtime and love. Rather a lot of love. Araman stood stock still in the doorway, unable to move. Who is this? He stammered. That is Belladonna, sir. Which number seven? The winner of the contest. You're not pulling my, my leg. No, sir. She's not uh, in an enchanted state. I mean, she hasn't taken on another shape just to bamboozle me. She looks like this all the time. All the time, sir. Belladonna, meanwhile was gazing rapturously at Armin, her heart in her eyes. This was the closest she'd ever been to him, and she was drinking in the flared nostrils, the tufty ears, the curve of his noble nose. Let's see a picture of Belladonna. Belladonna, said the magician, stepping forward. His voice throbbed, his eyes burnt, and his chest heaved like a pair of bellows. Airy? murmured Belladonna shyly from beneath lowered lashes. Airy! All my life I'd wanted someone to call me Airy. Lester and Miss, Mr. Ledbetter exchanged glances. Things were turning out exactly the way that they had hoped, but they hadn't reckoned on being it being quite so embarrassing. Ledbetter, we must be married at once. 
tomorrow at the latest, said Araman, who was now sitting on Belladonna's bed and grasping both of her hands. Mr. Ledbetter sighed. It was just like Araman to spend weeks grumbling about having to get married and then fall in love like a ton of bricks and make trouble for everyone. I'm afraid that's impossible, sir. There are wedding invitations to be sent, the food to be ordered, the bride's clothes to be bought. Three weeks is the shortest I could manage. Three weeks? I can't wait three weeks. Can you wait three weeks, my pretty? Oh my God, murmured Lester. He had forgotten how absolutely ridiculous people sounded when they were in love. But now at last, the really peculiar look of the tower room had gotten through to Armin, and without letting it go of Belladonna's hands, he looked with surprise at the exquisite snowflakes, the strings of gold and silver tinsel, the shimmering moonstones now dripping from the mouth of the wash jug. Catching every moment of her beloved's eyes, Belladonna flushed and said, I'm sorry about all this. It happened while I was asleep. You see, Ari, I feel that I should tell you that I used to be white. No, no, my treasure, said the magician doubtingly. That's quite impossible. Your hair is so golden, your cheeks are so pink, your eyes are such a lovely, lovely blue. I don't mean that, said Belladonna. I mean my magic was white. I was a white witch. She had gotten through to Aramin at last. A spasm crossed his face. My dearest love, you mustn't say such things. Oh, it's quite all right now. I'm not white anymore. I'm very, very black. Well, you saw how black I was. Rover made me... <gasps> she broke off with a little cry. Oh, how dreadful of me. How selfish and cruel. I left Rover in his matchbox all night. Oh, poor, poor Rover. Rover. He'll be so dry and sad. Terrence will never forgive me. She had freed her hands from Aramins and jumped out of bed and ran to the chair where her gown was lying. Here it comes, whispered the ogre. Belladonna had found the matchbox, had opened it, and was staring with, at it while the color drained from her face. When she spoke, it was in a voice so full of anguish and disbelief that they hardly recognized it. Rover is gone, said Belladonna. He's gone! There was a long, dreadful pause. I have to find him, Ari. I have to. He's my familiar, you see. Without him, I'm nothing. She began to search desperately, lifting up, lifting up knickerbocker glories and pushing aside the snowflakes. Ermin had started to help her when he saw the ogre beckoning to him from the other side of the room. Sir, said Lester, when he'd got his master outside the door, it is my belief that it ain't no good looking because that worm ain't lost. He's been stolen. I've thought so all along. All along, but Belladonna's only, only just noticed that he's gone, said Araman, looking puzzled. Lester saw that he'd made a mistake. If he told Araman that Rover had gone, been gone before the raising of Sir Simon, he'd get suspicious at once. Belladonna had made it clear that her blackness came from Rover, so if there were no Rover, there, were no, there was no blackness, and that led right back to Sir Simon, not being Sir Simon at all, but an actor called Monty Moon. I can't go into that now, sir, he said, but I can tell you one thing. Rover may not be a good performer, may be a good performer, but he's not up to shutting a matchbox after he's crawled out of it. No, that worm's been stolen, and I'll bet my bottom dollar I know who did it. Who? Which number six, that Madame Olympia. Ledbetter thinks the same. Oh, no, surely not. Aramon was very shocked. The one with the interesting, cruel smile and the rats? Lester nodded. And if I'm right, we ought to be getting down to a caravan quick. The witches are due to go back tomorrow. Heroin was frowning. The more he remembered the symphony of death, the more he thought that it would be better not to meet the enchantress head on. I think we'd better take her by surprise, he said, and that means disguises. How would you like to be a, ra a rabbit, Lester? Not at all, sir. Oh, come on, be a sport. No, sir. Absolutely and definitely no. Well, Araman and the ogre were talking, Madame Olympia was packing her things. Since Belladonna had won the competition, the Enchantress had been in such a towering rage that she had made three holes in the floor of the caravan where she had stamped her feet. She had also come out in a rash from sheer temper, and it was this which made her decide to go back to London immediately to her beauty parlor where she could make some creams and ointments to get rid of it. Then she planned to come back like the queen in Snow White with a poisoned apple or some poisoned stays, which she would sell to Belladonna at the door, which would kill her. Except that probably Belladonna did not wear stays. People did not seem to nowadays. So she would have to think of something else. 
Just now, she came out of the caravan to do one last job, and that was to throw some rubbish she did not want onto the fire. Some nasty, useless, disappointing rubbish that she wanted to get rid of at once and for all. And as she did so, a rabbit and a fox ran between her legs and bounded into the caravan. If she had bothered to look, she might notice that the fox was unusually handsome, with a great bushy autumn-colored tail, and that the rabbit, which looked cross, only had a single eye. But she only turned around furiously and said, Get out at once, you dirty animal! Shoo! Of course, they weren't dirty animals anymore. Sitting at the table were Armin the Awful and the Ogre. Good morning, said Armin, polite as always. How dare you, screamed the Enchantress. How dare you break in like this? Araman looked at her. An Enchantress' power is useless on someone who is truly in love. And Araman could see her now as she really was, and he did not like what he saw. We believe that you may have something that belongs to my fiancé, said the magician, her familiar to be exact. Her familiar? What on earth are you talking about? I have a perfectly good familiar of my own, as you can see. Madame Olympia kicked the cowering aardvark with the heel of her shoe. Then she shut her eyes and began to gabble something under her breath. But before she could get any further, Lester, following a signal from his master, had taken the full milk jug and upended it over the enchantress's head. Puh! sputtered Madame Olympia. Ugh. Milk is a well-known antidote to magic, almost as good as eating roses or holding a rowan twig. Quick, search the caravan ordered Araman, while the enchantress, groping for a towel, used some words that even Lester had not heard before. So they searched the caravan, turning out the built-in cupboards, opening Madame Olympia's half-packed suitcase, and feeling under the bed. Nothing. No sign of Rover. You see, jeered the enchantress, turn the caravan inside out for all I care. And she flung herself out of the caravan, picking up the little bundle of rubbish, and walked with a gleeful smile towards the fire. It was Araman who caught on first and ran after her, the ogre following. Stop! Stop! Let's see what you're burning! Never! shouted the enchantress and laughed. Then she brought her arm over in an arc and threw her bundle into the flames. Araman did not stop for any of the, the spells that would have made him fireproof or any magic words which, have doused, which would have doused the flames. Instead, he plunged his hand into the red-hot blaze and drew out the crumpled bundle just as it had began to catch. And there, dry and bewildered, looking at the bottom of a cornflake packet, was Rover. Belladonna, sitting wistfully in a chair in the tower room, greeted the earth room with a shriek of joy. But then she saw the magician's hand. Oh, Ari, you're hurt. How dreadful. And she took his hand and bent over it and began to croon one of her wholeness songs about the beauty of new skin and the cleverness of having five fingers. And almost at once, the pain disappeared and the blisters also. My angel, my little blossom, you've healed me, cried Araman, growing more and more bestoddled. Yes, but that was the old me, said Belladonna hastily. The new me is quite different, Airy. If you give me Rover, I'll show you. The ogre handed her the worm, which he damped down and fed it up with some moist earth as they came. What would you like, Harry? she said. Shall I turn the tinsel into some moldering thigh bones, perhaps? Sort of in a crisscross pattern? And what about making the snowflakes into gaping wounds? You do like gaping wounds, right? I adore them, my angel. They're almost my favorite thing. So Belladonna closed her eyes while the ogre and Mr. Ledbetter and Araman stood and watched. The next half an hour was one that none of them had ever forgot. Belladonna worked and worked and she worked, not once letting the strain and puzzlement show in her face, but at the end of the time she put down Rover and threw herself with a wail of ang anguish onto the bed. It's hopeless, she cried, quite hopeless. You must forgive me, Airy. you must wed another. My blackness has absolutely and completely gone. The others looked around the room once more. The strings of gold and silver tinsel were still there, but between them sparkled a chain of the most delightful fairy dolls. In the center of each exquisite Still unmelted snowflake, shone a diadem of flawless pearls, but it was the pot of pink and rather blobby flowers which had sprung up all over the place that made Lester's voice. When he spoke up, it sounded like a voice from the tomb. Begonias, said the ogre, shaking his head. Bloomin' begonias. It was in this moment of complete despair that Araman showed himself to be a most true and noble lover. 
My angel, he said, gathering Belladonna into his arms. What does it matter? You can fill the whole place with knickerbocker glories, and those are uh, pink blobby things, and it wouldn't matter to me. All I care about is you. But though she let her head rest for a moment on his manly shoulders, Belladonna was firm. No, Airy, you have a duty. Remember what the competition was about? Darkness is all, you said. Suppose we had... Her voice broke, but she pulled herself together. Suppose we had a white baby, or even a gray baby. What could a baby like that do with a devilish maze and a fiendish laboratory and all the other lovely things that you've worked so hard to make? How could a white baby keep wizardry and darkness alive in the land? You don't just belong to yourself, Airy. You belong to the doom and the dastardly and devilment in the world, and I'd never forgive myself if I'd let you forget what was right. And nothing that the desperate weather wizard could say would shake her. I'll go as soon as I can get my things together, she said, keeping her voice steady with an effort. If I'm so white that I can ruin a power from familiar like that, the further away I am better. Only I must say goodbye to Terence and give Rover back to him. She turned to Mr. Ledbetter and the ogre who were standing miserably by the door. By the way, where is Terence? I haven't seen him for ages. The ogre frowned. He wasn't at the campsite, he said. Are you sure? said Mr. Ledbetter sharply. He said he was going down to the campsite to get Belladonna's things and help the witches clear up. I was sure he'd spent the night down there. You know what boys are with tents. And their great sorrow laid aside for a moment. They all looked at each other with a new anxiety. Where was Terence? And that's the end of our chapters for today. We'll pick up with chapter 18 tomorrow. This is Witch Witch by Eva Abotson. And I'm Sarah Mari. I'm from Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. Thank you for listening. And I'll see you tomorrow for more. Bye.